Hello, everyone, and welcome to Accelerating Circularity's presentation, Putting Textiles to Good Use. My name is Janelle Toogood, and I am a project manager at Accelerating Circularity. Today, I will be presenting details for our upcoming US product trials. But I wanna make sure and let you all know that we are recording this webinar, um, if you don't already know that. And I also wanted to extend my thanks to all of you um, sincerely for joining today uh, to learn about the work that we're heading into. I'm sorry if I'm doing something funky here. Okie doke. Also, before getting started, I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors. Accelerating Circularity is supported in part through a generous grant from the Walmart Foundation, as well as Target, Gap Incorporate, Incorporated, VF Corporation, and Eastman. Thanks, guys. So I'd like to share, to get us, to get us rolling here, I'd like to share a brief passage from a book I've been reading lately by author Virginia Postrel called The Fabric of Civilization how textiles made the world. From the moment we're wrapped in a blanket at birth, we are surrounded by textiles. They cover our bodies, bedeck our beds, and carpet our floors. Textiles give us seat belts and sofa cushions, tents and bath towels, medical masks, and duct tape. They are everywhere, but to reverse Arthur C. Clarke's famous adage about magic, any sufficiently familiar technology is indistinguishable from nature. Clarke's third law actually states that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. It seems intuitive, obvious, so woven into the fabric of our lives that we take it for granted. We no more imagine a world without cloth than one without sunlight or rain. We drag out heirloom metaphors on tenterhooks, toe-headed, frazzled, with no idea that we're talking about fabric and fibers. We repeat threadbare cliches, whole cloth hanging by a thread, dyed in the wool. We catch airline shuttles, weave through traffic, follow comment threads, we speak of lifespans and spin-offs and never wonder why drawing out fibers and twirling, twirling them into thread looms so large in our language. Surrounded by textiles, we're largely oblivious to their existence and to the knowledge and efforts embodied in every scrap of fiber." End quote. Every scrap of fabric has a hand and a history attached, right? Fabric, when its application to a particular product has been spent, is too good to waste. And before we get going into the, into the report itself, I, I, I figured since we opened the door to science fiction with the Arthur C. Clarke quote, I'd go the whole hog and quote the other two of his laws that, that weren't quoted in the passage. One, when distinguished but elderly scientists state that something is possible, they are almost certainly right. When they state that something is impossible, they are probably wrong. And two, the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little way past them into the impossible. So hopefully that gives everybody a little inspiration to hold while we're going through what is sometimes some very technical stuff today. <laughs> so Accelerating Circularity's mission is to divert textiles from landfill and incineration for textile to textile recycling in order to reduce environmental impacts of that industry. Brands have made commitments to mitigate their waste issues and carbon impacts 
via changes to current production methods, as well as some business models. Some of those commitments look like textile exchanges and the United Nation Fashion Industry Charter for Climate Action, or UNFICCA, uh, challenges to put forward a 2025 recycled polyester challenge that aims to increase RPET uptake by 45% to 17.1 million metric tons by 2025. The United Kingdom's Wrap Textiles 2030 roadmap sets ambitious carbon and water reduction targets along a circularity pathway Brands have made individual commitments as well, including 100% of the cotton, linen, viscose, and polyester used in products will be recycled or have a more sustainable origin by 2025. And some of them have said they will source 50% or more of nylon and polyester from recycled materials by 2025. And even more comprehensive commitments look like establish a climate neutral supply chain for manufacturing and processing factories by 2030. How will we meet all these commitments? The volume of fiber used for cotton and polyester and their blends far outstrip the current capacity of both mechanical and chemical recycling, as well as the ability, and this is essential, to collect, sort, and pre-process the feedstocks that are needed to run through those processes. So we need investment, we need commercialization, and we need policy to help push capabilities. <clears throat> I was at a memorial service this weekend and the person who was honored there was a self-described late bloomer. He was quiet, but he did possess a sort of gift for one-liners. And he described his whole life path as a race to the starting line. I really feel that we're in that kind of a race together. And so we wanna talk about what the benefits of joining that race are. Well, by joining the trials, you'll be able to walk the talk suggested by all these commitments that we're seeing. For instance, we need to in collaboration, demonstrate circular, that, that circular systems are indeed possible. By joining, you will help demonstrate that circular systems indeed are possible, but you will also learn how they need to be practically supported in order to scale. You will gain understanding of what necessary change looks like to help articulate investment, opportunities, and policy needs to your partners. Economist Kate Rayworth delivers the image of the donut to help us visualize our operational spaces. I like to speak about this space in terms of innovation when thinking about communication to partners. As a designer for many, many, many years, I learned to crave limits and the creative freedom imposed by constraints. There's nothing worse than receiving a directive to just do better or save money, sell more or make it faster. These directives, I frankly found boring. It is much more challenging and beautiful to engage in the specifics imposed by constraints, including economic constraints. They lead to invention. We don't need to fear them. In fact, we all, need to realize that everyone everywhere without fail today must change in order to meet our obligations. Then we merely have the question left of what to develop facing us. The trials will help us to see what and where to focus our attention and efforts. And this helps us to become leaders of change. The trials will help everyone get a competitive advantage in being a leader of change. Leading change requires understanding the nuts and bolts of what is operating well already today in this space, what must be adjusted, and frankly, what may just be missing. Increase your brand's relevance and loyalty 
do this by means of building competence and expertise within the textile to textile system through your participation in the trials. This will require hard work, willingness, and the fun, we think, I think, of engaging with new partners and committing to new constraints across this stakeholder system. All this will help you deliver on your circularity and recycling commitments, should you have them. And finally, reduce your greenhouse gas, water, and chemical impacts. The commitment we all share is to solve the problem of living within our planetary and in recognition of our mutual, sorry, our planetary boundaries and in recognition of our mutual social dependencies. We don't need to set up circular supply chains for textiles because we have an economic problem here. The problem we have is environmental and by extension also social. Producing within limits imposed by a sustainable system is walking the talk. So the trials as we've designed them will allow us to pressure test our ability to run circular textile to textile systems. Trials will be run on t-shirts, jeans, and home textiles. These trials will include post-consumer, post-industrial, and virgin materials, working through collectors, sorters, preprocessors, recyclers, and the traditional supply chain. So you can see it's a big set of players that are around the table or on the team or whatever your preferred metaphor is. We have a goal to process over 50 tons of recycled fiber to yarn through the trial in the system, considering that around 18 million tons of textile is landfilled in the US annually, with 5.2 million of that coming from the East Coast of the United States alone. We need big change now and 50 tons just, sound, just, just sounds dwarfed when you think about how much is heading to landfill. Producers throughout the circular textile system have an opportunity to participate in building the future together and to demonstrate their capabilities in service of this new circular supply chain, network, economy. Brands have the opportunity to be the pull through, to catalyze the sorting and pre-processing needed to valorize spent textiles for use on new product, new textile product. The economics will then align, will align when we collaborate in order to operationalize in big circles that generate recovered, sorted, and pre-processed materials from spent textile in consistent qualities and in consistent volumes. When it comes, policy will also help to push to get everyone on the same page. So what's important before I move to the next slide about what we're doing in these trials is really um, testing it out in as a system. And we'll talk a little bit more about that next, but this is, I think, unique about how we're approaching the problem um, because it's not just one technology or another, one fiber or another, one product or another. Um, really what we're, what we're aiming to test, measure and report out on is how the entire supply chain, um, which does not truly exist today um, for recycled post-consumer, how that entire supply chain can operate um, in, orch in, in orchestration. Um, so for those of you joining the trial, I mean, I think it's really important that we keep that at heart as we move through all the practical challenges that I'm sure we're, we're here to face. Um, we'll, we're going to learn by everything. We'll learn by things that don't work as much as we'll learn by things that do. Systems as defined by Donella Meadows, 
um, who sort of co-authored that concept with this um, with the uh, Club of Rome are about the relationships between elements. Change in systems are not brought about by changing the elements within the system, if indeed you manage or can manage to do that, but about changing the relationship between existing elements. So in the report, there's a page that we dedicated to listing out all the elements that are involved in the trials. And what's interesting is that besides or other than chemical recycling, which is still under development and is, you know, relatively speaking, a new actor on the scene, there are no, quote, new elements being introduced. What is new, though, are the relationships needed between goods and processes. There are new limits imposed in the supply chain by materials and logistics, and there are new uses for existing technologies. So for example, sorting to post-consumer collection, or sorting post, sorry, put, sorting post-consumer collected goods, right, to color and fabric grades actually happens today, but not with an eye for recycling into the textile to textile market. And textile to textile recycling happens, but not yet with meaningful post-consumer quantities. Post-consumer spent textiles are recycled, but not too often into new textiles, rather they are recycled into rag or shoddy for other markets. Collection types and locations are leveraged by bin companies, by, by companies, private, private collecting companies, um, with an effort to manage quality of what they collect but that quality is targeted for resale markets, not consciously for recycling markets. So it's pretty neat to think about the fact that we're not really needing to invent a whole lot of um, new things, new technologies, new stuff, um, but that we need to be thinking about how to realign it. We'll achieve circularity when we manage to shift the relationships between things. In the report, there's also a brief um, guideline for the trials that we've put together to hopefully anticipate some of the questions that may come, but also to put some guardrails on things. Um, we've set some guidelines around minimum recycled content, traceability, end of life pathways, origin of collection, and MOQs. Um, and let me just take one second, by the way, it's to, to let everybody know that um, there will be time left at the end for questions. We've got the whole solid hour, and um, I promise I won't talk the entire time. So take your notes and save your questions and you can put them into the chat box and we'll get to them for sure. So what are recycled content targets? Uh, we're aiming for a minimum of 20% post-consumer textile in each trial with a target of 40% overall recycled content and wherever possible, more than that. In terms of traceability claims, they are transactional, sorry, transactional, not physical. We are not tracing physical inputs through the system as it's important, critical, that multiple input streams are able to be aggregated for quality control of feedstocks into the recyclers. End-of-life pathways for all trial products will include information needed for recycling, deconstruction, decomposition, or biodegradation for the end-of-life of the products that we're designing and creating through the trials. This information will be provided by the participants to Accelerating Circularity so that we can do aggregated reporting on that. We also have a systems partnership with a company named Eon. Trial participants have an option to collaborate with Eon to pilot application of digital identifiers on their products. Scannable identifiers connect users 
to Eon's data platform where data following the circularity ID protocol is housed for use by consumers and brands and also is to be tested by collectors, sorters, preprocessors, and recyclers. Origin of collection is within North America. We aim to keep as much of the production as we can through the trials in North America as well. However, brands have an option to buy into the trials at the fiber, the yarn, the fabric, or the finished good stage where brands procure trial materials to bring into their own supply chains, reporting on production location, final product content, and volumes produced are to be provided to accelerating circularity for aggregated reporting. And finally, MOQs will be honored across the stakeholder system. This is super important because we want to Again, pressure test the entire system at a commercial scale. And so meeting MOQs, everybody's individual MOQs involved in the supply chain is essential to mirror what can be. Participation in the trials includes options to collaborate, however, to manage those MOQs or to individually buy in, again, at the fiber, yarn, fabric, or finished good stage. Collaboration, as I mentioned, is a means to share in MOQs, where shared material diverges into a unique supply chain. For instance, if a brand were to buy, collaborate up and until the fabric level on shared specs for recycled fiber and yarns and fabric, and then take it off to their own cut, make, sew facility, they would be responsible for managing the individual MOQs from that point forward. If participants choose to design a unique trial from collection through to the finished goods, they'll be individually responsible to meet the MOQs across that whole supply chain, including collector, sorter, preprocessor, recycler, fiber, and yarn production MOQs. There'll be a few more examples where this will come up um, for people and, and I know there may be questions about how this is going to work. And so now we have the best part, right? Let's talk about the product. In order to collaborate and share on MOQs, agreement on target specs would be necessary. It's not a requirement to participate in a shared trial, but as mentioned, right, the meeting of MOQs across the entire supply chain is a requirement. And so we want people to at least consider a series of proposals that we've put together um, to sort of use as a means of collaboration. Um, these proposals are just that, they are not written stone. Um, they are sort of a, a point that everybody could gather around, check out what's there, and work together to create a common aim that works for everybody across the supply chain. That's, you know, not that's 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 in terms of technical requirements, but also volume requirements and other logistical questions um, that could come up. This page um, that you're looking at is an entire page of just T-shirts. Uh, with variations of fiber blends and recycling technologies. Uh, the lowly t-shirt happens to be um, not only beloved and comfortable and popular, uh, but also able to use recycled content and also is a good feedstock to provide recyclable fiber to the next generation of textile. Um, also, we produce millions and millions and millions of t-shirts every year. And uh, on top of that, the yarn, fabric, and finished product um, for t-shirts can all be manufactured within North America. So we're covering a range of target ratios and percentages across this field of proposals for post-consumer and post-industrial inputs, meaning textile, post-consumer textile, and post-industrial textile inputs. Um, there's, there's five trials here. 
recycled fibers um, across the whole span of these trials include cotton, polyester, man-made cellulosic, and acrylic via mechanical and chemical recycling of cotton, polyester, and cotton polyester blends. In addition, each trial has a unique goal. For example, trial two is designed to utilize inputs from three different recyclers, including mechanical cotton, mechanical PET, and chemical PET, and aims to maintain the potential for customizable color. Whereas trial four, with its goal of using 100% post-consumer inputs, combining polyester textile and PET bottles in both mechanical and chemical processes, puts a limit on color. Limits to color are affected by the ratios of feedstock types, as well as the blends of different staple fibers going into the yarns. Trial three aims to test the highest threshold for post-consumer content by combining RPET in the staple as a carrier fiber for the recycled cotton. All the trial proposals have been under review, um, so people know, by our spent textile brand and retailer working groups to be checked, you know, just for fundamental viability and marketability. As I said, they can be um, tweaked for sure as we go in and, and start to do, you know, the practical work. Um, but we wanted to make sure that everybody has a sort of place to start. Um, an example of this um, cohesion yarn sizes are being limited uh, on all the t-shirts to 20 singles or coarser um, for blends with recycled cotton for sure. Um, also the trial will be a test not only of the technical goals of each spec, but really the ability of the supply chain to meet the input qualities needed for each of these outputs. The pull through of the brand commitment on, on these trials is fundamental to getting a handle on that piece of it, on the flow of those materials through the collection, sorting and pre-processing um, facilities. So that's the t-shirts. Um, in addition to t-shirts, we'll also be running fleece product, denim and towels. There are two types of fleece being targeted. One is 100% polyester with 100% post-consumer content. And the other fleece proposal is a heavier weight cotton poly sweatshirt type fleece. Product type, um, which, is, which is listed here as a hoodie, can vary, um, doesn't have to be a hoodie. Although we think the hoodie is a terrific ambassador for textile to textile. But um, both fleece products will have color questions based on the ratio of post-consumer to other feedstock types in the final yarn blend. Um, people need to be aware that there's gotta be discussion on color and, and what can and can't happen. Costs will be impacted um, by the time and complexity to achieve the correct quality of inputs um, in terms of sorting and um, also in terms of the presence of contamination in, um, in what's collected and sorted and pre-processed go, for going into the recyclers processes. Uh, ditto for denim. We have three denim proposals. Each one combines different fiber types and recycling technologies for what will be uh, the weft or the fill yarn. For instance, uh, there is a 100% black over dye trial for a cotton poly blend. There's a soft denim trial that uses chemical cellulosic recycling of cotton blended with mechanically recycled and virgin cotton. And then we have a standard 100% cotton gene that will be a test case for post-consumer versus post-industrial inputs. Uh, in each of the denim cases, there's a percentage of virgin cotton fiber uh, to help carry the mechanically recycled cotton content which has invariably become a shorter staple version of itself through the mechanical um, recycling process. On the black gene, uh, actually this percentage is a bit lower because the polyester in the blend, which helps do the same job as the virgin cotton, props up the shortened staples of, its, of the recycled cotton friend in its blend. Each spec uh, for genes contains a percentage of Serona. Serona allows for stretch 
but doesn't cause the same kind of problems for recyclers as elastane. They're also minimizing the recommended percentage of Serona to under 4% or less. There is potential with denim for brands to collaborate on a shared warp and to run individual um, fill trials on that same warp. In that case, all partners would have to agree to a shared spec for that warp yarn. Collaborating on a shared warp helps to offset the MOQ, um, certainly, and to allow partner mills to dedicate multiple trials to one machine. Running test batches for unique fills on the shared warp um, carries a pretty low minimum from the fabric mill perspective. Doesn't really, um, it, there's still the yarn minimum that would have to be met though. Finally, the home category is another area for textile to textile innovation and is of great interest to the industry. Uh, our recommendation for trial is to do towels and this is based so far um, not just because, I mean, we want to do towels. It's a great product to focus on um, for many reasons, technical reasons, um, but uh, considering other kinds of home products, um, we ran into a bit of a wall due to the lack of wide looms, wide looms available in the US um, to weave standard bedding widths. That being said, we're excited to be working um, with a US mill on this trial um, who's able to supply and collect directly with clients um, and user clients and who could potentially implement take back programs that span across uh, the entire United States, perhaps even further. Um, so since there's just one trial for, for towels here, um, if you are interested in running any additional trials on that category or would like to share um, a specification for trial consideration, please register on our site and complete the brief questionnaire there. Um, on this slide, you can see the link, and I think that Amanda's putting it into the chat box as well. Um, you can go to our website, tell us who you are, and there's when you go there, there's a brief questionnaire, a brief survey, just a few questions um, that really help us to understand what uh, category you're interested in, what kind of, what stage of buy-in your company would be interested in, um, among some other things you're interested in, 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 in possible collaboration with Eon, et cetera. So um, really um, uh, would appreciate anybody who wants to participate to go there quickly. Um, I'm gonna talk about the timeline next. You'll understand the urgency. You know, yeah. I, I, I would just, I, I would want to, this is Carla. I'm sticking my nose in here, sorry. Um, I just wanted to reiterate, because I think that it's incredibly important that, you know, these uh, pro trial proposals that you've developed are all been um, pressure tested already with brands and retailers who looked at those and thought that they were products that they would be interested in purchasing. Um, they've also been vetted through, you know, as you said earlier, the spent textile working group, which, which for us um, are collectors, sorters, pre-processors, as well as the recyclers. So the idea behind developing these was to make sure that we had products that were feasible, that have the potential to go through a circular system, and that if there were, and to also be um, sort of inspiration for people if they have something that they think they would like to do, but it might be slightly different. And if you're willing to come in and meet all of the minimums, I mean, a big part of these trials is so that we understand what the flow can be all the way from collection through the brand demand, right? So when these things start flowing through, it's the materials that are being collected, they're going to flow through to a sorter. The sorter has to pre-process them. Once they come out of pre-processing, they'll go to a variety of different kinds of recyclers. And then what is it that those recyclers can make? So it's, the, it's starting to set up the system, set up the flow of circularity. And it's important, as Janelle said, for as many people to participate in this as possible. That's the only way we're gonna set up a system. 
Cool. So next step is to go to the stakeholder registry <laughs> and join the trials. We need as much collaboration um, as we can get uh, if we're going to, again, circling back to the commitments mentioned early in, in today's presentation. They are bold and they are audacious and we, <laughs> we need to um, just start making moves to figure out how we're going to do what needs to get done if we're going to meet those goals that are based on science-based targets, right? So um, it's incredibly important. Um, so I wanted to make sure you guys have seen the timeline for the trials. Uh, this, this is a timeline of the whole entire time uh, project that started back in March. Um, we're heading into, um, well, we're almost in August already, and so we're in the engagement stage. Um, if you didn't know it, we're engaging with you now. And um, look, we have a goal to have uh, everybody signed up who wants to participate in the trials by um, the 1st of September. Part of what needs to happen um, in terms of that is to determine a uh, what kind of product you want to make, um, at least in terms of the, 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 at least to the degree that we've specified in the proposals um, that have been shared already, specific cut makes so those specs and testing um, requirements by each brand uh, will also be um, required to be shared, um, but they don't have to come uh, before September. We just need to understand category, your buy-in stage, and you know the sort of direction on yarn specs that you'd be looking to do as a brand, um, and then also some uh, concept of quantity, because we've got to be able to tell the collectors um, how, and the, the pre-processors and, the, sort, and the, the sorters, you know, what kinds of quantities of feedstocks we're going to need to meet the demand. So that's all happening real fast, um, all within August. And then um, starting in September, we'll be working with the, the collectors and the sorters and the preprocessors to um, create those feedstocks to answer the specifications that we will be getting from the recyclers um, who will tell us what they need in order to meet these target outputs. Um, that are embedded in each of these product proposals. Got a couple months to get that done, September through October. And then starting in November, we'll head into the textile to textile recycling stage. And mind you, you know, these are not, I mean, the lines are going to be blurred. The boundaries of time will be somewhat blurred. <coughs> textile to textile recycling requires batch testing of especially of the, the post-consumer feedstocks coming into any of those plants. They've got to understand different things about what they're receiving before they run them through their very expensive machinery. Um, so there'll be some small batch testing before you know, doing any of the bulk um, production. So we're allotting you know, about four months of not just recycling, but really consider that a certain amount of R&D time. There'll be some, you know, a bunch of different um, tests that need to be run throughout that period. Uh, so that's all with a mind to head into the yarn and fabric production cycle uh, starting in March of 2022. Again, um, the spinning of these outputs from recyclers is going to take some R&D. Uh, you know, you saw or heard some of the complexity of, of what we're looking at doing in denim. Um, so, and you know, some, some of them may be more simple, some of them may be more complex. So just know that there's going to be some um, trial and error time in this period as well. We've got terrific, um, partners, uh, uh, mills already working with us to, to really creatively think through how to, how to go about doing this stuff. And um, we're so grateful for their help. So excited for that portion of it where we really get to you know, see what can be made. And we'll also be running tests um, throughout that period to make sure that we're meeting um, performance and, and, uh, and um, material requirements. 
RSLs, things like that um, throughout that period. Um, once we have fabric at the end of August, beginning of September 2022, that's when um, things are, you know, fabric is shipped to the cup make so again, whether it's through, excuse me, <coughs> an accelerating circularity partner directly, or whether it's um, somebody buying that fabric and bringing it into their own supply chain. Um, either way, th this is the time period we're looking at because the goal is to have final product um, available for the market, but also um, available for those who want to participate in collaborating with Eon to um, attach the um, digital ID hardware to final product. And then um, throughout that sort of end of the year and into the beginning of 2023, um, we'll be conducting evaluations of the whole experiment uh, so that we can report out to industry uh, in collaboration with you. We are we are going to be absolutely demanding about getting and as much in any data that we can get our hands on from, from you all when you're going through this process so that we can really pull it together and share it out to industry um, again in an aggregated form. Uh, but we, you know, we know everybody needs to have some solid information to go forward and uh, invest where they need to invest and hopefully capitalize on opportunities. Um, where they manifest. So finally, um, I just wanted to make sure to take a moment and say thank you to all those who make things possible. We, um, we wanna acknowledge you. Special thanks goes to our wonderful, wonderful, wonderful volunteers, including all the participants in the Spent Textile and Brand and Retailer Working Groups. Uh, also our board of directors, our steering committee members, our collaborating organizational leads, and also you, our future trial partners. Thank you. We'll be taking questions if you manage to have any <laughs> today from all of that. <coughs> I think we've got about 15 minutes. So now there were a couple of questions um, while you were going through the proposed trials about the inclusion of um, PET bottles. I wonder if you can elaborate a little bit more on um, the feedstocks, how they're being sourced, um, the different combinations and the reasons behind those selections. Sure. So one of the reasons, so going, to, so in terms of polyester, right, um, the, the industry, the mechanical polyester um, recyclers know a lot about how to convert PET bottles into yarn for use in textile. Um, they know the viscosity, they know the rate that it's running, they know the cost, um, they know a lot. And so, um, introduction of what is also PET, but in polyester textile form uh, into the process. Um, they, they plan to blend the, that form of PET. It, it all goes through the same heat and pressure system in mechanical polyester recycling, <coughs> but introducing that new format, you know, there's some concerns. I mean, the polyester does melt, but it can also char. It can introduce, um, you know, black uh, to, into the the mix. Um, so they need. So there's. It's a sort of aid to help, you know, introduce something new into a process. And as we learn more, as we trial more, um, you know, obviously the end game or the end goal is to mitigate. Um, use of bottle uh, feedstocks into recycled polyester um, yarns, but we've got to sort of start where we've got a leg up and, and the recyclers um, have some, you know, something, some knowledge to mitigate the risk. I hope that answers. Uh, maybe there's more I could say. We have a question about um, nylon spandex 
um, being used as feedstocks. Could you speak to that, Jenna? Yeah, I mean, well, nylon is a totally different um, recycling process. And in fact, nylon is included in the Accelerating Circularity European trial. Um, so I don't know who's asking the question, but if you want to <coughs> engage with us on that, through, through the European trial that could potentially be possible. Um, elastane, you know, elastane is, or spandex, another name for it. I mean, some processes can deal with a certain amount of it. Um, the chemical um, processes can, can, you know, separate out the, the, the feed, the, can separate out the fibers, um, and 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 use what they can use through the recycling process with with nylon as well as with cotton cotton and polyesters in some cases and other blends in other cases, um, but you know it all it, it's it's not necessarily a usable thing. It just kind of becomes a byproduct in that case if indeed the percentage of elastane present you know can be dealt with at all. Great. Um, Janelle, we've got a question about um, what the brand commitments look like in practice um, in terms of, you know, committing to offtake um, amounts, contracts, et cetera. Could you just walk through the various options that are available to brands in terms of buying in and, and what operationally that looks like for them? Right, so signing on, right, you need to let us know, sort of, as I said, categorically, um, what product area you're interested in, what sort of spec direction you're interested in. Great, if you wanna opt into one of the proposals <coughs> that we are working from, <coughs> but also um, what needs to be um, thought about and, um, and communicated is yes, what, what level of buy-in to the trial um, your brand would want to entertain. So um, really that includes participation in all stages, which would be 100% um, through the trial collection all the way through to the finished goods um, in partnership you know, with accelerating circularity and the trial partners that it's sort of put into a team for that process um, utilizing every single one of them. Uh, if you are the only one that joins a trial like that, there's no other collaborators, then you would be 100% responsible for all the MOQs across that trial. If there are multiple other brands who are similarly interested in sharing a trial, then your MOQ exposure um, you know, would be less based on, on the number of other people who want to participate there. Um, so that's one thing. Then from a buy-in stage, um, again, the options for buy-in on t-shirts is a little different than jeans. So for, for t-shirts, there's the option of buying in at the yarn stage where, you know, again, there's a shared um, collaborative identification of a spec across multiple brands and everybody sort of shares everything up and until the yarn production stage. Um, they could do the same thing, but go all the way through to the fabric stage. Um, so whether it's at the yarn or the fabric stage, you would buy, you'd be responsible to meet either an individual MOQ or a percentage of an MOQ, depending on who you're sharing with. And then you would bring that into your own supply chain. That's on t-shirts and fleece. Um, on the denim, actually, people, brands could buy in one stage back. They could, they could get a hold of the fiber. Again, they could collaborate on, um, on a fiber feedstock coming out of one or more recycling processes plus virgin, but then they could take that fiber that they purchased and they could bring it into their own yarn spinning facilities if they so chose. And then again, they would be responsible for their own MOQs um, off on that other trajectory. It's important that, you know, if people buy in at an early stage and bring things into their own supply chain, I mean, in the spirit of the, of the trials, you know, we're, we're really looking to pressure test a system that reflects 
the commercial commercialization of it and and scale. So you know we're trying to dissuade people from taking things and then going off and making capsule collections <laughs> because we're just not going to learn as much as we would otherwise. And so that you know hopefully that informs your selections up front so that you have the whole project and you have the best chance of um, you know working at scale all the way through to the cut mix so and product. I don't know if I'm missing any other commitments. Um, we do need to know up front if you're interested in, in collaboration with Eon as well and, and further information can be sent about that if, one, if you indicate it in the stakeholder registry. Janelle, there's a clarifying question about the role that Accelerating Circularity will play in terms of um, if and when brands collaborate um, what role does accelerating circularity play um, in sort of hammering out all of the details to ensure that all of those requirements are agreed between all the parties? Yeah. So, I mean, I think, first of all, I guess, setting the table, having a place um, or, or being the interim, uh, facilitating communication where needed between all those people. It's not just between brands, but it's, you know, always it's, it's also across the entire stakeholder body. So, you know, whatever brands decide that's got to be in tandem with other partners, um, including the collectors all the way through, right, to the recyclers um, and forward from there. Uh, so convening, you know, being that convening place for people to present, you know, what they agree to, what they have challenges on, that's going to be one, um, one piece that will, one part that will play. Um, also, we'll be um, helping to assist there being like a shared baseline of tests that will be conducted across each uh, stage of the trials, um, knowing that brands all have their own individual tests that, that they have to see are met. Um, we are assembling, you know, a sort of baseline floor of the of those same tests so that at least everybody knows that there's certain things that we all agree to um, our standard. Um, am I missing anything else that we're that we're doing? In term and I mean, we're also providing, you know, sort of the, the data capture for everybody's experience again across the entire supply chain, so that we can pull that in and you know start to build out a business case that is um, from an industry perspective, not just um, from any one singular brand or other stakeholder perspective. Um, Janelle, a few questions have been coming in with respect to chemical recycling of PET. Um, what's the path taken? What is the specific technology we're looking at using? Um, so can you just sort of give us a, a more uh, focused look at the chemical PET pathways? Yeah, and this is where Carla, I might need your um, help to boy my technical knowledge here because yeah I, I'm, you're I'm helpful happy. here yeah i'm happy to step in so one of the things that we're doing right these are the u.s trials and so what we are looking at is um, chemical recyclers that are actually processing product or able to process product um, in the united states and so based on that, there are um, really two companies that are recycling um, polyester materials in the United States. And so we're going to be um, using those two technologies. One of those technologies actually they output is uh, syngas, which will then actually be turned into um, an acetate product. And then uh, the other chemical recycler uh, they can take in um, blends, and so the output for them are both cellulosic and, and polyester. Um, what they would be producing would be prop, what we would be purchasing would be polyester chip or what would go through the trials. Uh, there is potentially one um, uh, recycler that, that's based, not based in the United States, but maybe we would do trials with their product. Um, um, through a U.S. spinner so that the chip would be sent into the United States and then we'd extrude it in the United States. So it's, there are 
three different products, different processes, but it's based on what's available here. And I think there might be another recycler on the line that if they wanted to join and they were able to have the um, uh, capacity to run product, we would be happy to have them engaged as well. I believe that covers most of the questions that I've seen come in over chat. Oh, here comes something. Uh, question about the use of Serona. Um, how does it compare to conventional elastane? Um, is this, you know, is this issue of spandex um, specific to chemical or chemical recycling? Uh, speak a bit more about that. Um, I can weigh in on that. So the the reason that Serona is in there, and there are actually um, some other products as well that are similar to Serona, in that they are while they are have stretch, they have some element of stretch in it. They actually are recyclable in a um, polyester recycling process downstream. So if you recall, um, when Janelle was talking about the, um, the guidelines for the trials that we also wanted to be able to, um, you know, we're taking things from post-consumer materials, post-industrial materials, but we wanted the products that we made um, to be able to go back into the circular system. Elastane creates problems, um, certainly at certain low levels, uh, around 2%. Most um, recycling systems can take them, not all, uh, but we also thought that if we had a product or we suggested a product that went through a polyester recycling system, that that would be uh, an ideal a better, potentially a better option. And there's a follow on question um, that I don't know the answer to. So I'll put it to the floor. Is Elastol P T400 uh, recyclable like Serona? No, I saw um, somebody from that company on the line earlier, not sure she's still here. I, I know that's, I want to be careful. Um, Jean, can you answer that question for us? Randy's saying yes. I believe it is, but I just want to be careful because we, we're really careful. Um, Carla, can you hear me? Yeah, there you are. Hi, hi. Um, yes, the, the, the issue really is whether, um, whether there's any contamination in terms of <clears throat> the polyester stream. So, um, so part of T T400 is um, a bi-component of PET and PTT, which is Serona. So if you're finding in the trial, you can successfully um, recycle Serona. Um, then you should be able to successfully recycle T400. Yeah, that's what I thought. Thanks. Okay. Perfect. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is actually a great question to cap off this event with. Um, I, I'm happy to take a stab at it, but I know Carla and Janelle will probably both want to weigh in. Um, Joanne asks, what precautions is AC taking to ensure the textiles going into these trials are not usable and we're truly landfill bound? Um, we are, are really deeply concerned about this because we're not driving material change if that's not the result of, of our work here. Um, and so one of the issues that our spent textile working group spent quite a bit of time working on is really developing our spent textile use case hierarchy, which you know, is sort of inspired by the conventional waste hierarchy, but we're really drilling down into it and, um, and refining it so that we see where textile to textile recycling sits in that value hierarchy, and then figuring out the ways to ensure that all of our activities fit in the right spot. 
Um, so some of the ways that we're addressing that on a practical level are we are going out and visiting collectors of spent post-consumer textiles and talking about the ways that we can say, you know, just because we want 100% cotton, like if it's got a higher value, if you have a customer for that already, that's not what we're looking for. So we're, we're having these one-on-one -on -one conversations with the people who would be supplying that um, feedstock. Um, but on principle, we're, we're building all of our systems on the assumption that, that we only really wanna be targeting long-term materials that would have gone to landfill or incineration. Carla, do you wanna elaborate a little bit more on that? One of the things that I would say, I mean, you answered that perfectly, Sarah. Um, but the other thing that I would just mention is that if a product today has um, another life in it for reuse, certainly um, the collector sorter can sell that product for more money than what the recyclers want to pay for it. So there is an economic aspect to it as well. Um, you know, there are probably some, um, you know, some instances where maybe, you know, people would be able to get their hands on something and, and sell it for a, a low price. But ideally we're looking for product that have been um, damaged, quality problems, uh, you know, ripped, torn, stained, all those things um, are, are certainly um, uh, great feedstocks for textile to textile recycling. Great. I think that's. I think that um, we've we've covered most of the questions. So I will I will hand the floor back over to Janelle. Cool. Thanks, Sarah. Great. Um, well, I don't have anything um, more to to offer except for that we really encourage everyone to consider joining these trials and um, make hay because the day is short. Um, the month is short and August is the time to go. Uh, so we look forward to hearing from uh, any of you who would like to do that. And if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to myself, to Amanda, to Carla, um, to Sarah, uh, with any, anything that comes up after we're done talking today. Thank you so much. <laughs>